In this video, we are going to continue exploring generative art by looking at generative geometry. More specifically, we are going to be looking at a sketch from the generative design book that uses simple geometry, polygons, and a transparent background in order to generate a bunch of cool geometric patterns. In doing this, we are going to be looking at jitter matrices, jit gen, and background transparency. Let's see how this is done. There are two things I want to do initially. First, I want to set up a visual output system. And secondly, I want to investigate these generative artworks to figure out how exactly I can port them into Max MSP. To set up my visual output system, I'm going to create a jit.world. I'm going to give it a name like geom, and I'm going to set the regular attributes such as floating set to one and FSAA full scene anti-aliasing also set to one. Now I can create a toggle by pressing T, connect it to my jit.world, and there we go. It's running. There is nothing interesting happening here, as it usually is at the very beginning, but some interesting things will hopefully take place here. In the meantime, let's examine our sketches. Now, this is from the book Generative Design, or more specifically, this is from the website of the book Generative Design, and there are a lot of P5.js sketches here. Now I'm using this website again because this is part of a series in which I take these P5.js sketches and use MaxMSP concepts and techniques to port them into MaxMSP. But this time I'm going to be moving on from the color category, even though there are a few I want to get to eventually, and I will step into the shape category. More specifically, I'm going to be looking at the first three sketches here uh, because they are all using similar concepts and ideas. But eventually, we will be recreating this third sketch. Still, what is in this first sketch? Well, if I open it and if I start moving my mouse on this canvas, I can see that there is a circle. The circle is filled in by all these lines and the amount of lines as well as the length and width of these lines are determined by the position of my mouse. So I can generate all different kinds of shapes, lines and line circle combinations using the position of my mouse. Pretty basic, but also really cool. If I look at the second sketch, there isn't anything until I click on the canvas. When I click on the canvas, I am drawing the seemingly random geometries, polygons, onto the canvas. However, the real magic happens when I click and drag my mouse on this canvas. And suddenly, I am really drawing with these polygons. And there seems to be a logic in the amount of sides these polygons have, as well as their sizes. Uh, their general sizes, and how strong these lines are. So the longer a certain polygon stays, the stronger it appears on the canvas, meaning that we can really create these complex, cool looking geometries on the screen. And the third sketch is the exact same as the exact literal sketch. However, there is one small added function, and that is the ability to change colors. By using the number keys on my keyboard, I can change the colors of these polygons, which lets me paint in colors as well as with shapes on this blank canvas, which makes for really, really, really cool geometric patterns. All right, that's all good, but how do we adapt this into MaxMSP? More specifically, how is this made exactly? Well, we need to notice a very important fact about all of these polygons that are being created. No matter the amount of sizes, as in if it's a triangle or a polygon or a, uh, I don't know, a hexagon, it doesn't matter. All of these polygons are what we call cyclic. A cyclic polygon means that all corners lie on a single circle. This is called a circumcircle, which is a funny word to me, but that doesn't matter right now. The point is that in a cyclic polygon, we can look at all the corners and we will see that they all they will always line up with the circumference of an imaginary circle. Furthermore, if we look at these polygons, we can also see that all of these corners are distributed evenly along this circumference of the imaginary circle. And this is going to be the methods with which we are going to calculate the positions of these sites and then we are going to connect these sides together using lines. 
Let's go back into Max. Now, how are we going to draw shapes in OpenGL geometry? How are we going to define these custom shapes in JIT world? Well, we only need to use JIT GL mesh, which is an intimidating object, right? It has a bunch of inlets. It says one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine inlets, and that's eight inlets too much if I'm learning about a new object. But we are going to be using only the first inlet, which says that it is a vertex array or it is expecting vertex arrays in any case let's give it some arguments now as it is with most JITGL objects this object is going to expect the name of the drawing contexts as the first argument so JITGL mesh geo furthermore we are going to give it some attributes such as draw underscore mode how are these vertices these points in space are going to get visualized well let's start by saying points draw mode points Secondly, let's give these points some colors. Uh, so let's give them a color of completely white. Uh, that is going to be one, 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 one in the RGBA color space. One red, one green, one blue, one alpha. All values are at maximum, meaning that we get a nice white color. And thirdly, let's set the points underscore size attribute. Let's make the size of these points larger. By default, this is one. I will make it five. Okay, now if I send a jitter matrix into the first inlet of this object, what is going to happen is that the values in the cells of that matrix are going to be interpreted as Cartesian coordinates, x, y, or x, y, and z coordinates, and that is going to be used in this case to draw points in my window right here. Let's try this with a random jitter matrix, so jits.noise, two planes because we are going to be only using x and y coordinates, in this video, float 32 data type and give me, I don't know, 10 points. This goes into the first inlet. I create a button by pressing B that goes into my jitter matrix or jit.noise in this case. And when I click it, there we go. Each time I click it, I get these bunch of random numbers and run the random points uh, on the top right side, the top right quadrant of my window right here. It's on the top right because these are only positive values. However, this, Carte this 3D Cartesian coordinate system is taking the middle point as 0, 0, 0. So I should also dip into the negatives if I want to make use of the entire screen. All right, now let's go back to jits.matrix. All right, if I create a jitter matrix, by default, all the values in there are going to be 0. So I'm just going to get all the points overlapping one another in the center of my window. Now, what is happening here? Once again, jitter matrix two planes, meaning each cell has two pieces of values associated with them, uh, X and Y coordinates in this case. Float32 is the data type. This lets us use uh, floating point numbers. The details are not important for this video. And this 10, 10 is the dimension of my matrix. This is a 1D matrix. There are only 10 cells. They are ordered I guess horizontally, there is cell number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and that is my matrix. Now, the dimensions here are going to determine the amount of sides in or generated polygon. So let's start with three. I want a nice triangle. I love triangles. I love Pythagoras and I love triangles, and I want to generate a triangle since it is easier to generate a triangle than to generate a Pythagoras. What I need to do then is to use JIT gen. Not JIT gen U, but JIT gen. JIT gen is going to process this matrix, uh, more specifically the cells in this matrix, one by one, depending on the or uh, using the algorithm I define in the sub patch contained within JIT gen. And this is the way that we are going to figure out uh, the sides, the corners of our cyclic polygons. Let's think about this. If we are going to be generating the positions of the corners of our cyclic polygons, well, they need to be evenly distributed around this imaginary circle. Now, to calculate the, these positions around the circumference of a circle, it doesn't make sense to use Cartesian coordinates because that is not what that is suited for, right? It is not very circle friendly, these Cartesian coordinates. However, we can use something called polar coordinates. And since JITGL mesh at the end of the day is going to expect Cartesian coordinates, we can simply use pol to car to convert our polar coordinates into Cartesian coordinates. We can then use VEC00 to 
pack the resulting x and y coordinates in a vector, which is a fancy way of saying list in this case, and the resulting list goes into out1, meaning that each specific cell is going to have these two values or a 2D vector uh, associated with them as they come out of JIT gen. Now let's think about this polar coordinate business for a second. Polar coordinates are ways of determining positions in a given space uh, with two values, polar radius and polar angle. Polar radius means the distance of our coordinate, of our point, from the center point, so the distance from the zero point. The angle right now doesn't matter, the only thing that matters is the distance. And for us, this is going to be a fixed value. So I can just create a new object. I can type in, I don't know, 0.8, and that can be it. However, the polar angle is a bit more tricky. The polar angle is the rotation of this point after we have figured the polar radius. By how much are we going to rotate this point around the center point? Now, this here in JITGen is calculated by the means of radians. And all that we have to know is that the circumference of a circle is 2 radians, which equals to 2 pi, pi times 2. Therefore, let us calculate the step size, as in as I iterate through this jitter matrix, as I look at the corner number 1 and corner number 2 and corner number 3, I need to figure out how much of the angle should I increment in order to go around this imaginary circle. Here is how I'm going to do this. I'm going to use two objects, dim. This is going to give me the dimension of my matrix, in this case, three, and then cell. This is going to give the cell coordinates of the input matrix. This is going to be different for each cell that is going through this algorithm. Cell number zero is going to give me zero. Cell number one is going to give me one. Cell number two is going to give me two, and so on. To calculate the step size, I need to take 2 pi, and this is a constant in JIT gen, by the way. I can just create an object and say 2 pi, and JIT gen is going to understand exactly what I'm saying. And I need to divide 2 pi by whatever my dimensions are. Right? right now, this is going to be probably a triangle, so it's going to be 3, but as I increase the dimensions of my jitter matrix later, this algorithm is going to keep up with that. After I have calculated my step size, I can then multiply the step size with the cell coordinate. And this, the resulting value from this operation right here, is going to be the polar angle. There we go. All right, so we have calculated the step size, we have multiplied it by our cell coordinates. This is the polar angle, the polar radius is for now a fixed value. By using Poltecar, we have taken these two values and we have converted these to Cartesian x and y coordinates. We packed them together because the result has to be this single vector, and we have sent it throughout one out of our JITGen object. Now let's see what is going to happen when I click this button right here. I get a triangle. Well, it doesn't really look like a triangle right now, but uh, if you have good eyes, if you are very good at geometry, you can imagine this imaginary line connecting all of these points, and that is going to be a triangle. Okay, now I can simply generate other kinds of polygons with more or less sides. Well, less sides would be a bit tricky, but still I can generate them using a very simple message. Dim, dollar sign one, comma, bang. Let me explain. In a message box, dollar sign one is a very special combination of characters. When I sent this message box, any kind of message, an integer number, a float number, a symbol, whatever, it is going to replace this dollar sign one with whatever is coming in. So this message, if I type in four, for instance, this is going to be dim four comma bank. All right, so dim and then the number is going to set the dimensions of this matrix and then comma bank is essentially saying after this first message is sent, send an additional bank. So dim dollar sign one, this message is sent, it's calculated, there is this shit matrix has a new dimension or has a new size, and then it receives a bank, sending it to JITGen, and then JITGen processes this and sends it to JITGL mesh. So what is going to happen if I send this to message four? 
There, now I have a rectangle or a square more specifically, or a polygon and so on and so on. If I have a lot of these little points here, a lot of corners, so to speak, then we very clearly see that this is indeed a circle. This is the circumference of a circle, and all of these points are distributed evenly along this circle. But of course, we want to generate some geometry, not some fancy circles. In any case, good to know. Now, let's turn these into actual polygons. And how do we turn these into polygons? Well, we have to use another draw mode. Right now, we were using draw mode points. I'm going to change this points into line underscore loop, and I'm going to hope I remember this right. I do remember it right, fantastic. So changing the draw mode to line underscore loop is changing how these vertices are interpreted. And line loop means connect each vertex to the next one, connect each point in this space to the next one, and make sure it's a loop as in when you get to the final point, connect that to the very first one. Using this, and let me clear my max console here because I do like to be proper and clean. Um, after we do this, we can now change the dimension of our matrix and we are going to be generating all different kinds of polygons. And just like that P5JS sketch, this is going to be cyclic. These are going to be cyclic polygons. Fantastic. Let's move on. Now I want to make this mouse interactive. Right? So what I need to do is I need to get the position of the mouse when I click on this window. Luckily, this is already sent from the final, the last outlet of JIT world. If we hook that up with a message box, there we go. It sends a message, mouse, something, something, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. So after mouse, we have the X coordinate in pixels, Y coordinate in pixels, 0 or 1, telling us if the uh, left mouse button is clicked or not, and then a bunch of zeros that are not really important. So we need three things out of this. We need the X and Y coordinates, and we need the zero or one, the mouse, left mouse button toggle thingy. That is not the official name. So let's use the route object. Route mouse is going to only let true messages beginning with mouse from its first outlet, and it's going to cut out the mouse portion of that message. Then I'm going to use zl.slice3 to slice out the first three elements here. Right, so now I have the x and y coordinates plus that 0 and or 1. Now, when I work with these mouse interactive systems in JIT world using MaxMSP, what I like to do is to normalize these coordinates. And to do this, I need to use the getAtter object. I'm going to give it the argument size because what I want is the size attribute of my JIT world window. And now this is a bit backwards. I need to take the middle, the second outlet of this object, and connect it with JIT.world. And when I do this, something magical is going to come out of the first outlet of getAtter. That is the size, the size of the window. Each time I change the size, this value changes and gets updated as well. And how do I get normalized coordinates? If I divide this set of values, I mean the first two here, the 227 and 213, the X and Y position of my mouse and pixels, if I divide this with the screen size, that is going to give me the normalized mouse coordinates. So let's use ZL slice 2. I mean, this doesn't make sense right now to use ZL slice 3 and then ZL slice 2 again, but we can find a more elegant way of doing this later. Right now, this is giving me what I want, right? 181 or uh, the X coordinate and the Y coordinates, 540, 291, whatever. Then I can use the Vexper object to evaluate mathematical expressions for a list, and I can give this as an argument a mathematical expression. Dollar sign $f1 divided by dollar sign $f2. Now if I connect these guys to the right locations, if I delete this message box, if I change the size of my window and I click my window, I'm going to be getting, there we go, the normalized coordinates. The leftmost side is 0, the rightmost side is 1 for x coordinates, 
the top of the window is zero, the bottom of the window is one for the y coordinates that I'm going to be receiving. So we do have our normalized coordinates. Now let's split these apart and let's think about how this shape is going to be affected by the mouse position. If we go back into the sketch, we can see that the x coordinates affects the size of this polygon. However, it's not completely linear. If I'm at the middle of the screen, it's really tiny. If I go to the right, it gets bigger. If I go to the left, it gets bigger, but it's kind of flipped. That, actually, that is actually one of the things that creates these intricate geometric patterns. That is something we can do in a relatively easy way. To do this, let's go back into JITGEN and let's think about what we have to change exactly. If we are changing the, the size of the entire thing, we are essentially changing the polar radius of our calculation. Right now, this is a fixed value. This is 0.8, but we want this to be a parameter. A parameter is a value, a variable that we can change from outside of the JITGEN patch. So instead of 0.8, I'm going to type in param. I'm going to give this parameter a name. Uh, let's call it um, gen size, so generative size. And let's give it a default value. It can be 0.8 as always. So right now, it's not going to be any different, right? I'm still getting the exact same polygons because it just uses the default value that is 0.8. However, now I can create a message box and I can type in gen size dollar sign one. And I can send any value here to change the size of the resulting polygon. Of course, just changing this is not going to update the polygon, and this is something we need to think about. We need to make sure that these polygons are generated constantly, right? That is not so efficient in terms of computation, but this is simple enough that we don't really have to care about it. So I can use the second outlet of JIT.world, which is going to send a bang on each frame draw, meaning that if my JIT.world is rendering at 60 frames per second, I'm going to get 60 banks per second. And now, each time I change something about my algorithm, it is immediately going to be reflected in my JIT.world window. And I can see if I change the gen size, indeed, it gets larger and smaller. And if I dip into the negatives, there we go. It is flipped just like it was in the P5JS sketch. So how do we synchronize this with the X mouse coordinates? Well, we have our normalized coordinate here, so I can simply unpack this, unpack 0, .0, .0 dot, And I can start routing this information. Right, so this is the x normalized x coordinate of the mouse, and if I want this to be in a specific range, I can use the scale object. Right, scale object is expecting four arguments: the input range and the output range. The input range in this case is zero to one, and I want the output range to be between minus 0.8 to 0.8. This is something you can change as you wish, as you want, when you create or play with this patch yourself but these are the values that I want. Okay, so there we go. Now, as I'm clicking and dragging the mouse, the shape of this polygon is changing accordingly. And what else is happening here? Well, apart from that, it's very simple actually. The X coordinate is controlling the size and the Y coordinate is controlling the amount of corners or the dimensions of our matrix in this case. Now you might be thinking, yeah, there are also these awesome transparent trails left by the shapes. Why aren't we doing that? You're, that, that, that? That is something we are going to do in a second. That is the hard part or the harder part or it involves a concept that is slightly harder to understand. So we are just playing with shapes right now. But we are going to get there. First of all, let's get the Y coordinates of our mouse. And we again want to scale this, right? I want to use a scale object and I'm going to say, well, the input values are between 0 and 1. I want these to go between instead from 2 to, I don't know, 10. Right, and I'm kind of crossing cables here, which is not something I like to do. But this should set the dimensions of my polygon as my Y coordinate changes on the screen. Yep, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then 
all the way to the edge is 10. All right, there we go. So now I can create all different kinds of polygons. I can change their size all by clicking on the window. Now, how are we going to deal with these transparent trails? First of all, we there is a setting, a preference in Max that we have to change. So if I go to Max and Preferences, I am able to see something called a graphics engine. You should be able to see this too if you are opening your preferences window and you are looking at the all tab. You should be able to see graphics engine in the jitter section of this window. Now, by default, the graphics engine is going to be GL Core. That is a newer, cooler graphics engine with more possibilities, but it does not have alpha trails, or it does have them, but uh, they are much more difficult to accomplish. So make sure that this is set to GL2 if you are playing around with this patch, or if you are trying to recreate it, or if you are trying to work with alpha trails. When you do that, Max is going to ask for you to restart it, which you should happily do. Okay, with that out of the way, what we have to do to receive and play with transparent backgrounds is to change the color of the background. More specifically, we have to change the alpha value of the background. And we can do this by playing with the erase underscore color attribute of jit.world. Just like JitGL mesh, this is going to be RGBA values, and we can make this completely black, for example, 0, 0, 0, 0 then we need to turn this toggle off and on again, by the way. But this should work. And if everything is zero, look at what is happening. I'm getting a bunch of these cool trails. Of course, this is not the P5GS sketch yet. I can reset everything by changing the window size. But still, now I'm now my algorithm is not drawing hundreds upon hundreds of shapes here. What is happening is that the background is transparent. So each time we draw something, it draws it on top of whatever there was before without having to calculate whatever there was before. The cool thing happens when we set to set the alpha attribute of the erase color attribute or the alpha value of the erase color attribute to something between 0 and 1. For example, if I set it to 0.25, there the shapes are disappearing but they are kind of leaving these trails. If I make it very low, like 0.1, they are disappearing in an even slower manner. If I make it 0.01, now I'm going really low, but it's still not exactly zero. I am drawing these lines, but they are just disappearing in their own time. This can be useful for all sorts of generative artwork, algorithms, and concepts that you can explore at your own leisure. But for our purposes here, we need to change a few things. First of all, I'm going to set this alpha value back to zero. What I want to do is to change the alpha value, not only of the background, but also of the shape itself. I want to create a transparent shape here. I want this JGL mesh to generate a transparent polygon. And how can I do this? Well, I can change the alpha attributes. Uh, so instead of setting the color to 1111, this can be 1110.1. But I also have to add another attribute, and that is blend underscore enable set to 1. Doing this is going to make sure that the transparency is drawn on the screen in a way that makes sense. So my background has 0 alpha, and my shape has 0.1 alpha. What is going to happen? when I start drawing shapes. Uh -huh, they are very faded unless I hold a shape at a, cer at a certain location. When I do that, the transparency piles up and it becomes more and more visible. And this is essentially the technique that is used in the P5JS sketch to have these shapes of different varieties. Now let's continue on by adding two more functionality. I want to be able to delete the current picture and that is something I can do in the sketch by the way by pressing backspace. And I also want to be able to change the color of this shape or at least the color of the current polygon that I am drawing on the window. To reset the backgrounds, I'm going to do a bit of trickery. I'm going to create two messages, erase underscore color 0001, 
so it's maximum alpha, and erase underscore color 0000, zero, zero, zero so it's minimum alpha, what we want normally. I'm then going to create this button for now. I'm going to change this into some spacebar input in a second. And I'm going to create a delay object. Now, delay object is going to delay a bank uh, by an amount of time given as an argument. This is going to be in milliseconds, I believe. So I'm just going to type 100 milliseconds or 100 for 100 milliseconds. Now, if this delay object receives a bank, it is going to send it out from its outlet 100 milliseconds later. And this kind of setup is going to let me erase the current visual by first setting the erase color, the background color to full alpha. So just, you know, nothing from the previous iterations are kept. And 100 milliseconds later, setting it back down to zero, turning on transparency again. Great. But this reveals another problem. This JITGL mesh is always on. I want this to be visible only when I'm clicking on the on the window and if i want to do that uh, i need to extract this zero or one that comes out of my uh, jit world going through root mouse going through ZL, uh, zl slice 3 i need to extract this and i need to use this as a on off toggle for jit gl mesh now i'm going to remove the zl slice 3 because it's actually completely useless everything should work without that zl slice 3 and instead i'm going to create a zl nth object this is going to act as a lookup uh, object that is going to look for a specific indexed element in the incoming list so if i type in zl.nt3 i'm going to get the third element in this list which is the on off toggle information for the mouse I can hook this up to a toggle if I want, so I can really see things toggling on and off. All right, now how can I use this information? How can I use this data? What I can do is to use the enable message, enable dollar sign one connected to JIT GL mesh. If I create a toggle, if I reset everything, when enable is on, enable one is going to make sure this JITGL mesh exists and is drawing things in my JIT world canvas. If it is off, it is going to draw nothing. So if I just use whatever is coming out of this Z, uh, ZL nth three here, and I just route this to enable dollar sign one, each time I click and hold my left mouse button on the screen. I'm going to be drawing shapes. If I let go of my mouse, there are no shapes being drawn anymore. And you can see how easy and intuitive it is to generate these cool geometries just by clicking on things. Now, if I don't want to have to press a button here all the time, I can use the key object, which is going to report keyboard presses. I can then type in cell 32 in a new object box and make sure that first outlet of key, key is connected to cell 32. This is going to make cell 32 send out a bank each time I press the space bar on my keyboard. So I can draw things here. All right, cool shapes, great, fantastic. And then space bar and reset it. Great. So finally, let's add some color. And this is going to be very easy because what we are going to do is we are going to create a bunch of message boxes to change the color of JITGL mesh. The color of JITGL mesh is going to be different based on these message boxes. So color, or I don't even need to type color, I can type in RGB A value such as um, 0, uh, 1, 1, 1, 0 0.1. So this is white. And then 0, 0 0.8, 0 0.4, 0 0.1. This is a nice greenish bluish color. Then 1, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0.1 this can be a reddish color and lastly I want 0, 0 0.2 0 0.9 0 0.1 and this is going to be a very bluish color and this should be a message box as well all right now all of these should have color at their beginning so I'm going to use appends color to make sure any message that goes into this append object receives the message color at the beginning of it all right if I click these objects now 
Oh, sorry. Append adds the message to the end of the message box. What am I doing? This should be prepend, prepend color. There we go. Now color is at the beginning of all of these message boxes and these can go into JITGL mesh. So there, now it's white. Now it's a nice greenish, bluish color. Now it's red. And now it is blue. We can, of course, uh, use the same system as the P5JS sketch, as in we can use key presses to change these colors, and that is as easy, easy as using the key object. And then we can figure out which ASCI codes of the keys that are pressed are coming out of the first outlets. So if I hook this up here, one, two, three, four, that is 49, 50, 51, 52, meaning I can use the cell object and I can give these values as arguments to cell, 49, 50, 51, 52. And the outlets then should be connected to the appropriate message boxes. There, it's that simple. Now, as I'm drawing here, if I press one, there, it's completely white. If I press two, it's green. If I press three, it's red. And if I press four, it is blue, which makes for this very old school 3D visual. But of course, you can change the colors as you wish. In fact, you can change anything you want about this sketch. There are a lot of interesting things you can do after you figure out how this works. You can think about distortion. You can think about other kinds of shapes. You can see if you know how to generate other kinds of polygons or visual shapes. You can even think of a musical angle to all of this. You can use the system to generate tones or drive an oscillator with the resulting pattern or something like that. But just as it's shown, this is already a very fascinating generative art piece. And we have created this by using simple geometry and background transparency. And I personally find that really cool. In any case, I hope you have fun creating and playing around with this. And thank you for watching.